All right, I want to begin a study today in the book of Jude. This is a one-chapter book. It is the book that precedes a book of Revelation. Now, we have studied the book of Daniel. The Gentiles. It deals with the second coming of Christ. Christ is presented in the book of Daniel as the stone hewn out of the mountain without hands that comes down and smashes Gentile world powers. Then that stone grows and fills the earth, representing the earthly reign of Christ and his millennial kingdom. The time prophesied by Isaiah the prophet back in Isaiah 9, verse 6 down to verse 8, when he said the government shall be upon his shoulders and he shall rule the nation with a rod of iron. The stone that's hewn out of the mountain in Daniel 2 and rolls into the feet of the image is Christ who comes to set up his earthly kingdom and fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. Now, the book of Revelation also deals with the second coming of Christ. The book of Revelation talks about uh, the things which must shortly come to pass. That's Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, God's shortly in Revelation 1, 1 has been 1,900 years or more. But we must remember that with God, time means nothing. God is eternal. He always has been and always will be. And one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now, the book of Daniel, while it talks about the coming of Christ, is taken up mostly with describing the times of the Gentiles, that time when Gentile world powers are in rule, are in authority. And it describes the various Gentile world powers and what will happen to them. It prophesies the rise and fall of the various different Gentile world empires. We've studied that. The book of Revelation also talks about the coming of Christ. But the book of Revelation is taken up almost exclusively with describing the tribulation period or that seven-year period known as the 70th week of Daniel. And you'll remember that the 70th week of Daniel is that 70th week that is yet unfulfilled. It's a week of years or seven years. In Revelation, beginning with verse uh, or chapter 6, and going through chapter 18, you have a description of this seven-year period. So you have most of the chapters in the book of Revelation describing the tribulation period or the 70th week of Daniel. Chapter 6 through chapter 10 in Revelation describe the first half of the tribulation period or the 70th week of Daniel. And then chapter... Uh, 14 through chapter 18 describes the last half of the tribulation period, which is also known as the Great Tribulation because it is greater than the first half, in that in the last half of the tribulation period, the Antichrist has broken his covenant and all hell breaks loose on earth. Now let me say that again. Chapter 6 through chapter 10 of Revelation describes the first half of the tribulation period. Chapter 14 through chapter 18 describes the last half of the tribulation period. Now chapters 11, 12, and 13 of the book of Revelation is a parenthetical portion. And these three chapters describe the chief participants of the last half of the great tribulation period. Chapter 11 talks about the two witnesses. And uh, chapter 12 talks about the sun-clad woman and the, uh, and the man-child she gave birth to and so on. Chapter 13 talks about the false prophet and the beast or antichrist. So chapter 11, 12, and 13 introduces us to the chief participants of the last half of the tribulation period. Now, I've taken this much time to talk about this because the book of Jude fits in a very important place in the Bible. Now, I know that chapter divisions and verse divisions in the Bible are not inspired, that chapter divisions and verse divisions were later added by man. 
But the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God, and we believe the Bible. And we do not have any question about whether or not the Bible is the Word of God. Now, it's very interesting that the book of Jude comes just before the book of Revelation, and the book of Revelation talks about the coming of Christ, about the tribulation period, and the reign of Christ on earth. It deals with eschatology, the doctrine of the last things. And just before the Bible discusses the coming of Christ, the tribulation period, and the millennium, you have this little one-chapter book, the book of Jude. It is the vestibule to the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Acts gives us the early history of the church, and the book of Jude gives us the the, the late history of the church. In other words, how Christendom will be before the coming of Christ. The book of Jude is the only book in the Bible that is taken up entirely with discussing the great apostasy which is to come. Now, may I say a word briefly about an apostate and about apostasy before I go any further? And every Christian ought to understand what an apostate is. An apostate is one who deliberately rejects revealed truth. Now, wait a minute. A man could be in error because of ignorance. He would not be an apostate. For instance, here's a man who's accepted Christ as his Savior. But he's never heard the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. He's never heard anyone teach it or preach it. And so he doesn't know whether he believes it or not. He may not even believe in the coming of Christ. He is in error because of ignorance. He's never studied the Bible enough to know. He hasn't heard enough Bible teaching or preaching enough to know. And he's in error because of ignorance. But later on, he gets into a good Bible-believing church. And the man preaches on the second coming of Christ and quotes the verses from the Bible telling that Jesus Christ is going to come again. And this Christian, who did not believe in the second coming before, as he hears good Bible teaching and preaching, is suddenly convinced that Jesus is coming because the Bible says so. And he sides with the truth that is found in the Word of God. And his heart rejoices because he's excited over the fact that he has discovered this truth of the second coming. You know, I know a man like that. As a matter of fact, he was a preacher. And for years, he ridiculed and laughed at people who preached that Jesus Christ was literally and physically coming again. As a matter of fact, he laughed at the premillennial doctrine especially about Christ coming to reign. He said when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he said, buddy, it's finished. <laughs> Christ is not coming back. Well, friends, you know, that guy got a hold of an old Schofield Bible and got to reading the footnotes in that old Schofield Bible, and got to run the scripture references, and got the studying and the uh, uh, subject uh, index, and the various subjects found in the, at the footnotes of those pages. And he learned that Christ was coming again, and he told me personally. He said, you know, it's almost like being born again. If I thought you could get saved twice, he said, I'd think I got saved twice. When I learned that God was not through with the nation of Israel, and that uh, Jesus Christ was actually coming again. He said it was like being saved all over again. And he was in the country giving away Schofield Bibles. He was so excited. He wanted people to learn the truth of the second coming. Now, the second coming's in all Bibles, by the way. It just so happens that the Schofield has footnotes in it uh, that uh, are very premillennial, although I disagree with some of Schofield's footnotes. They're, they are good, solid uh, footnotes, and uh, it's a good study Bible for any Christian who wants to study the Bible. Now, you can be an error because of ignorance. That's not apostasy. But apostasy is deliberately rejecting revealed truth. All of us at some time or other have been in error because of ignorance. And some of us probably still are in error because of ignorance. I speak now especially concerning the Bible. 
And there's some things we will probably understand later on that we do not fully understand now. But the difference between an apostate and a man who is in error because of ignorance is this. When a man who is in error because of ignorance sees the truth, he is very happy to have discovered the truth. And his heart always lines up with truth. And he says, thank God I've discovered this. Uh, you'll pardon the personal reference, but I did not believe that Christ was coming for years. And uh, I'd always heard that Christ was not coming again. And in my own personal Bible study, I begin to see verse after verse that said Christ was coming again. And when I discovered from the Bible the truth, then I took sides with the truth and I began to teach that Christ was coming again. You see, I was an error because of ignorance, but I was a Christian. I had trusted Christ as my Savior, and my heart wanted to do right. You know, if you really are saved, your heart wants to do right. You may not be perfect, but, and you may make some mistakes. You may make some deliberate mistakes sometimes. But a man whose heart is right with Christ will not deliberately reject revealed truth. When he sees what the Bible says, he will admit that it's true and the Bible says it and it's going to happen. Now, an apostate's different than that. An apostate is one who deliberately rejects revealed truth. Now, an apostate is not someone who does not have religion. He has his religion. He believes in God, but he doesn't believe what God says. Oh, he said, I'm, I'm a religionist. I'm not an atheist. I believe in God. But now this business of a whale swallowing Jonah, I don't believe that. Well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in this business of the Red Sea parting and the children of Israel going across on dry ground. I don't believe in that. Oh, I'm not an atheist. I, I'm not a heathen. I believe in God. But I don't believe this business of Jesus feeding 5,000 men plus women and children with loaves and fishes, just one little sack lunch. I don't believe that. In other words, an apostate reads what the Bible says. He has been taught it. He sees it. But he deliberately rejects revealed truth. Now, that's what an apostate is. Now, let me say it again because I really want you to understand this. An apostate is one who deliberately rejects revealed truth. He sees what the Bible says, but he says, I don't believe it. I won't accept it unless I can put it in my little test tube and I can rationalize it and reasoning it out, I will not accept it. Now, that's an apostate. Now, you may have some good Christian friends who are in error because of ignorance, but if they listen and they read and they learn, they will see what the Bible says and they'll say, I'm glad I discovered the truth. And man, I'm happy to get on the right side of this particular issue. And I want to be on God's side and on the Bible side, no matter what men think and no matter what the popular opinion is. Now, this book of Jude talks about apostasy, and it talks about apostates. Let me give you this brief little outline of this book. Verse 1 and 2, you have assurance for the believer. In verse 3, you have an injunction to the believer concerning the faith. Now, in verse 4, apostates are described, and it tells where they came from. In verse 5 through 8, you have Old Testament examples of apostasy. In verse 9 and 10, you have apostasy in the supernatural realm. In verse 11, you have an ancient trio of apostates. In verse 12 and 13, you have apostasy in the natural realm. In verse 14 through verse 16, you have apostasy in Old Testament prophecy. 
in verse 17 through 19, you have a further description of apostates. And then in verse 20 through verse 23, you have the believer and the faith. And then again in verse 24 and 25, you have more assurance for the believer. Now you see by that simple little outline that most of this book is taken up with describing the apostasy. And this book of Jude comes just before the book of Revelation, which discusses the second coming of Christ, the rapture of the church, the tribulation period, the millennial reign of Christ, and then eternity. Now let's look at this book, and we're going to begin today to read Jude, and we'll read verse after verse and comment on these verses as we go. Verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Dr. Schofield uh, gives this division to the first two verses. He says this is the introduction. It's part one. I want you to look at the very first word, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. Jude places his name at the very beginning, a little different than what we do today. Today, when we write letters, we usually put our names at the very ending. And uh, I do not know that it wouldn't be best that we put our names at the very beginning of our letters. Because if you're like I am, the first thing you do when you get a letter <laughs> is you open it up and turn to the last page and see who wrote you. And when you see who has written to you, then you go back at the first of the letter and begin to read it. So I don't know that it's not a bad idea to put our names at the first of the letter rather than the last of the letter. So here Jude puts his name first, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. And then the second thing I'd have you notice is that Jude, after signing his name at the first of the book, called attention to his heavenly relationship before he mentioned anything about his earthly relationship. You see, your relationship to God is more important than your relationship to people. You are first right with God, and then you get right with people. Somebody said if your vertical relationship is correct, then your horizontal relationship will also straighten out. And that's a good thing to remember. Get your vertical relationship right. Am I right with God? Do I stand right before God? Is my relationship with God right? And if your relationship with God is right, then your relationship with your fellow man can be gotten right. But you cannot reverse the order. Right with God first and right with my fellow man second. You know, there are ten commandments. The first four commandments sum up man's relationship to God. And the last six commandments sum up man's relationship to man. And the relationship to God and duty to God comes first. And our duty to man and relationship with man comes second. Jesus said the great commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbors yourself. Love God first, love your neighbor second. Get right with God, get right with your neighbor. Uh, discharge your duty toward God, and then discharge your duty toward your neighbor. In Acts, Paul said that I may have a conscience void of offense, both toward God and toward man. First he said, I want my relationship right with God, and I want my conscience clear toward God. And then he said, I want my conscience clear toward man. So Jude first mentions his relationship to Christ, his heavenly relationship, and then he talks about his earthly relationships. And that's the proper order. I wish I had hours just to talk with you out of my heart 
about your heavenly relationship. Are you right with God? Have you been born again? Do you know that if you died today, you would go to heaven? If you're not sure of that, you ought to get a hold of some Christian and sit down and have them show you out the Bible how to know that. Uh, you ought to call here at the office at Forest Hills Baptist Church. We'd be glad to help you. We'd count it an opportunity and an honor to take the Bible and show you how to know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. Make sure your relationship with God is right. There's a lot of emphasis today on being born again and on religion. And I am so excited about it, I don't know what to do. Uh, I picked up, I believe it was Time magazine, and two big words across the front, born again. And in the magazine, they're discussing various religions. I don't agree with all the religions, but I'm glad there's an emphasis being put on born again. And I rejoice in, in this big emphasis on religion. And I hope we keep it in the news and keep it in the news and keep it in the news and keep it in the news until Jesus comes. Here it is, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, according to the Bible, James is the brother of Christ. And Jude is the brother of James. So that makes Jude the brother of Christ. Galatians chapter 1 verse 19 says that James is the Lord's brother. And here the Bible said Jude is the brother of James. Now Jude could have said Jude the brother of Jesus Christ because Jesus had four brothers according to the Bible. I mean they had the same mother. Of course I know that they did not have the same father because Jesus was supernaturally conceived, but they had the same mother. And Jude could have said, Jude the half-brother of Jesus, our brother of Jesus Christ. But instead he said, Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. He valued his heavenly relationship as the servant of Christ above his earthly relationship, earthly relationship as the brother of Christ. You know, all of us cannot be the brothers of Christ in the sense that Jude was. But we all can be the servants of Christ in the sense that Jude was. And isn't it wonderful that Jude prefers to talk about his heavenly relationship as the servant, the doulos, the bond slave of Jesus, rather than to talk about his earthly relationship as the brother of Jesus. Because really, his heavenly relationship as the bond slave of Jesus is far, far, far exceeds his earthly relationship as the brother of Jesus. Now that word servant, I'm told, comes from the Greek word doulos, which is bond slave. Jude was happy to see himself as the bond slave of Jesus. Dr. Kenneth Weiss says that word means one born in slavery. He says there are two kinds of slaves. There are those that are taken in battle and others who are born in slavery. The word translated slave here is those born in slavery. When Jude was born again, when by faith he became a child of God, he was born into a relationship with Christ as the slave the servant of Jesus Christ. Not many Christians like to hear that. You are a son of God by faith if you've trusted Jesus. But I want to tell you something else. If you've been born again, you're not only a son of God, you are a slave of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says that you're not your own. You have been bought with a price. You belong to Christ. You are the bond slave of Jesus Christ. He's the master, you're the servant. Most Christians don't live like that, but they ought to live like that. They ought to take the attitude, Dear Lord Jesus, I'm the slave and you're the master, and anything you want is all right with me. I'll do anything you want. Jude said, I'm the servant. I'm the bond slave of Jesus Christ, born in slavery. 
And that word translated servant also means a slave who is so bound to his master that he serves the master to the disregard of his own interest. His interest is doing what the master wants, not what I want, what the master wants. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Christ and called. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 said, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God, which is in you, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. As a Christian, God owns you. God bought you lock, stock, and barrel. He bought you with the blood of Jesus. 1 Peter 1.18 says, You were not redeemed or bought with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The word precious there means valuable. If you are a Christian, you too are a slave, a doulos, a servant of Jesus Christ. And the doulos is one who serves his master to the disregard of his own interest. His will is swallowed up in the will of his master. The word doulos means a slave that is so bound to his master that only death can break the bonds. Either the master dies or the slave dies, or else he remains a slave. Now, since God never dies, and since you as a believer have eternal life, your relationship to Jesus as a servant or slave is an eternal relationship. For that reason, every Christian ought to do what the Bible says. He ought to be an obedient Christian. You ought to go to church because you're a slave. You ought to pay your tithe because you're a slave. You ought to read the Bible and pray and win souls because you're a slave. You ought, if you can sing, you ought to sing in the choir because you're a slave. You don't tell the master what to do. He tells you what to do. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. The word sanctified here doesn't mean sinless perfection. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins plural, acts of sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The word sanctified means to be set apart. Now, if you are saved, you have been sanctified positionally. You are set apart as belonging to Christ. Peter says we are a peculiar people. The word peculiar can be charted by putting a dot on a chalkboard and drawing a circle around it. The dot is peculiar to the circle, which simply means that it belongs exclusively to the circle. Now, you are sanctified. You are set apart. You belong exclusively to Christ. You are his bond slave. And you ought to so live as to demonstrate the fact that you belong exclusively to Christ. You should never say yes to Satan or to the flesh or to the world. Now, I don't mean you can be perfect. I know that uh, all of us at some time do things that are wrong. But perfection ought to be our aim. We may never attain it, but it ought to be our aim. When a mother bakes a cake, she may not bake a perfect cake, but she ought to be aiming at perfection and thus turn out the best cake she can. When a mother washes the clothes for the little baby, she may not do it perfectly, but she ought to be aiming at perfection. And then the clothes will turn out the very best the mother could do. Then the next time she washes, she ought to be aiming at perfection again. Your life as a Christian should aim at perfection, though you may never attain it. You are sanctified. You are set apart. You belong exclusively to Christ. You are not your own. You are bought with the price. Since you do not belong to yourself, you ought to be careful with yourself. Here's what I mean by that. When I was a boy and we borrowed something from a neighbor, like say we borrowed a hoe or an axe or some other implement, 
my father would always see that we were more careful with somebody else's property than we were our own. He'd say, son, be careful with that. Remember, it doesn't belong to us. Be careful, son, don't break that. That's not ours. And when I'd take it home, my father would make sure it was clean and in the best of condition. Now, you do not belong to yourself if you're a Christian. You belong to Christ. And you ought to be very careful with yourself because that's somebody else's property. Be careful how you talk. Be careful how you live. Be careful how you treat your body. It belongs to Christ. That's borrowed property. And you'll have to answer to God for the way you took care of it and what you did with it. Now, the word sanctified simply means set apart. The word saint means a sanctified one. We're sanctified by God the Father. Now, there is a progressive sanctification. That's not what the verse means here. There is a progressive sanctification. John 17, 17. Jesus prayed, Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth. In other words, as they read the word of God, they'll see things that are wrong. And as they see things that are wrong, they'll lay one sin aside, then another sin aside. And as they read the Bible, they are being sanctified with the word. The word is truth. Uh, I have uh, seen in the last few years things that are wrong that I did not see as wrong several years ago. And the more you live for Christ and the more you read the Bible, the more you'll see things that are wrong and the more you'll lay aside. That's progressive sanctification, becoming more and more like Christ. The verse here has to do with positional sanctification. You are his. He bought you. You belong to him. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now may I pause to say a word about being preserved in Christ. This verse teaches eternal security. You are preserved in Christ. I've heard people talk about the perseverance of the saints. As a matter of fact, one of the five points of Calvinism is perseverance of the saints. Well, may I tell you that I do not believe in the perseverance of the saints? Now, wait a minute. Well, you say, do you believe a man can be lost? No, no, no. I believe in eternal security, but not the perseverance of the saints. The saint is not eternally saved because he's going to persevere. That is, you strain and work. And you persevere, and you finally endure to the end, and you make it. Perseverance of the saints means that everybody that's a Christian will persevere to the end and be saved. But the Bible doesn't teach the perseverance of the saints. The Bible teaches the preservation of the saints. I believe in the preservation of the saints. That verse says we are preserved in Christ. We don't persevere we are preserved. Remember, my mother used to preserve uh, figs and uh, peaches and strawberries. She'd put them in a jar. And she'd put the old rubber ring around the top of the jar and get the lid and tighten it down as tight as she could possibly get it because she wanted to make sure that the thing inside that jar did not spoil. If the thing inside that jar spoiled, it wasn't preserved. If you open it, Five years later, and it's still as good as it was when you put it in the jar, then it's been preserved. Now, the Bible said we are preserved in Jesus Christ. <laughs> the Bible could have said we have been pickled, but it said we've been preserved. <laughs> Too many Christians look like they've been pickled. But you're not pickled, you're preserved in Christ. Once you accept Jesus Christ as Savior, you're saved forever. That can never be changed. I do not believe that a person who's trusted Christ as Savior could ever lose his salvation. The Bible said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, that we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed, Father, keep them 
through thy name those whom thou hast given me. That's John 17, 11. We are kept. We do not keep ourselves. Charles Spurgeon said, If it should ever come to pass that sheep of God could fall away, alas, my fickle, feeble soul would fall 10,000 times a day. Now, friends, if we had to keep ourselves, then I would not believe in eternal security because I do not think any person is able to keep himself. But we don't keep ourselves. We do not persevere. We are preserved. Now, my friend, 10,000 years from now, you'll be just as good so far as your salvation is concerned as you are now. You're safe. You're kept by the power of God. You're preserved in Christ Jesus. That little expression, in Christ Jesus, is very interesting. I heard an old country preacher illustrate eternal security like this. He said you put a little barrel in size, inside of a middle-sized barrel and put the middle-sized barrel inside of a big barrel. He said before you got to the little barrel, you'd have to tear up the big barrel. Then you'd have to tear open the middle-sized barrel before you could ever get to the little barrel. He said that God is the big barrel. Jesus is the middle-sized barrel, and I am the little barrel. Well, his illustration's good. You are in Christ, and Christ is in God. You are under double lock and key. You are safe. I probably shouldn't take too much time speaking about eternal security, except that it's here in this verse. We are preserved in Jesus Christ and called. The Lord prayed for the Father to keep those <clears throat> excuse me, that had been given to him. And then in John 11, Jesus said, I thank thee that thou hast always heard my prayer. God always hears Jesus when he prays. And Jesus prayed for our eternal security. By the way, 2,000 years ago, Jesus took every sin you ever have committed and every one you ever will commit if you live to be a million years old. Jesus bore those sins in his own body on the tree. God punished Jesus in your place to pay the debt that you owe. Now, when Jesus died, that debt was paid. <clears throat> and Jesus said, it is finished. And then God raised Jesus from the dead as a declaration of the fact that he was satisfied with the payment that Jesus had made. Now, friend, if the debt's been paid, then you'll never have to pay it if you accept what Jesus has done. Don't you see, you could not believe that you could lose your salvation and believe in the substitutionary death of Jesus because that contradicts itself. If Jesus died for my sins, then why would I have to go to hell for any sin that I committed? If Jesus paid the debt, why should I pay it? That have God collecting twice for the same debt. Now, God is a just God, and a just God said sin must be paid for. But a just God will not allow sin to be paid for twice. He'll not collect the same debt twice. And when Jesus died on the cross, God collected the debt. It is paid. We are preserved in Jesus Christ and called. The next verse says, Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Now, that's the proper order. Mercy is first. I describe mercy as being something that God withholds from you, though you deserve it. Let me see if I can illustrate that. Um, a man commits a crime. He deserves to serve three years in jail. But the judge shows mercy and lets him off. He doesn't send him to jail for three years. He lets, he lets him off. That's mercy. Mercy is God withholding from us something that we deserve. We are sinners. We deserve to go to hell. But God in his mercy did not give us what we deserve. Mercy unto you and peace. Peace always follows mercy. There can be no peace apart from God's mercy. There are two kinds of peace. There's peace with God, 
Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That word peace simply means that God and I are no longer enemies, that God regards me as a friend. And uh, before I'm saved, I'm an enemy of God. But once I trust Christ as Savior, then God and I are friends. You see, Jesus said, You either gather with me or you scatter abroad. You're either for me or you're against me. There's no middle ground. If you're not a Christian, you're against Christ. And you're an enemy of God. Oh, I know some people are not saved said, but I'm not against God. And I'm not against the Bible or, re or religion. I'm for Christ. But my friend, if you've never accepted Christ as Savior, the Bible says you are against him. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. They that are not for me are against me. It is that simple. It is that easy. Now, when you come to Christ and trust him by faith, you're justified and you have peace with God, which means that you and God are no longer enemies. Then there's the peace of God that we have in our hearts. And this comes when we take everything to God in prayer. And don't worry about anything. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Be careful for nothing. That is, don't be filled with anxious care about anything. But in everything, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and so forth. And the peace of God uh, shall keep your minds. The peace of God means the very peace that God enjoys, you can enjoy in your own heart. Mercy unto you, and peace, and love be multiplied. And then in verse 3, Jude said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now before I continue with verse 4, let's discuss verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you. That word beloved means divinely loved ones. Christians are loved of God. We're divinely loved ones. When I gave all diligence to write unto you. Jude was saying to Christians, I'm writing to you. God's word is for God's people. The unsaved man cannot understand the word of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, A natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Now, wait a minute. I don't mean that the natural man is not supposed to read the word of God. Of course he is. He should read the Bible. He should accept Christ as Savior. But I'm saying that until a man actually accepts Christ as Savior, he'll never understand the Bible very well. Oh, he'll understand enough to be saved. But it's a, it's a case of having to know the author in order to appreciate the book. The natural man received not the things of the Spirit of God. The Word of God is written to the people of God. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation... Common here means our salvation held in common by all of us. It's something we all have. Jude says, you're saved, I'm saved. It's a common salvation. I get the idea here that Jude wanted to write about salvation. I haven't known many preachers who did not want to preach about salvation almost all the time because the preacher's desire is to win as many people to Christ as possible. Jude wanted to write about common salvation. But when he said, uh, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It was needful for me. I was going to write about common salvation, but it was needful for me. Constraint was laid up on me of the Holy Spirit, according to the marginal rendering here. Jude said, I want to write about salvation, but the Holy Spirit constrained me to write something else. 
by, I might ought to say in passing, that the Bible is not the product of man. The Bible is a product of God. We are not reading here the words of Jude. We are reading here the word of God. Jude was a human instrument that God used to have this book written. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Bible is the word of God. And Jude wrote what he was told to write by the Holy Spirit. The Bible said that holy men spake as they were moved on by the Holy Spirit. So Jude is writing here, but the Holy Spirit's telling him what to write. And he says, it was needful, our constraint was laid upon me of the Holy Spirit. Jude said, I want to write about salvation, but the Holy Spirit constrained me to write about something else. The Holy Spirit constrained me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, Jude said there's something that they are to contend for. They are con to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Now, sometimes we talk about the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Certain basic cardinal doctrines are fundamental and cannot be sacrificed. I think I probably ought to spend some time uh, mentioning these fundamentals. When we talk about our faith, we talk about our statement of faith. We talk about what we believe. What is your statement of faith? We mean by that, what do you believe? Most churches have a statement of faith. It may start off by saying we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe Jesus Christ died for sinners. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. It may be a little more complex and thorough than that. But that's a statement of faith, what you believe, your doctrinal statement, your statement of faith. Every church has one. Now, the faith that Jude has in mind here is the faith which was once delivered to the saints. The faith, meaning the fundamentals of the faith. One of the fundamentals of the faith is the virgin birth of Christ. If he was not virgin born, then Jesus Christ is a sinner. He inherited the same sin nature that we inherited when we were born. And thus, he's in the same predicament we're in, owing the same sin penalty. If he's a sinner, owes the same sin penalty, then we don't have a sinless substitute to die in our place. If we don't have a sinless substitute to die in our place, then we don't have a way to go to heaven. Because the only way to heaven is through the sacrificial death of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for sinners in the sinner's place to pay the sinner's debt so the sinner could go free. You go to heaven on the basis of payment made. You are a sinner. God took all your guilt, transferred it to Jesus, and then punished Jesus in your place to pay the debt that you owe so that he could be a just God and still allow you to go to heaven. And when Jesus died on the cross, he cried out, It is finished, which means the debt has been paid. It is complete. Everything necessary for the sinner to go to heaven has been accomplished. Now, if Jesus had not been virgin born, he would have inherited the same sin nature we inherited. And thus, we would have no Savior and no plan of salvation. Romans 5, 12 says, By one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death is passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. By one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. When Adam disobeyed God, he became a sinner. As a result, everybody born since Adam have been born sinners. We all died spiritually in Adam. The Bible said, in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. By one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death is passed upon all men, for in that all have sinned. If I were to take a postcard and put it inside my Bible and mail my Bible to China, what would happen to the postcard? The same thing that happened to the Bible. Why? By virtue of the fact that the postcard is in the Bible. 
If I put a postcard inside my Bible and then burn my Bible in the fire, what happens to the postcard? It burns in the fire. Why? Because it's in the Bible. Whatever happens to the Bible happens to the postcard because it's in the Bible. Now, before when Adam sinned, no children had been born. All children were born after Adam sinned, after what we call the fall, after he disobeyed God. Now, as a result, when Cain and Abel were born, they were born sinners. And the first child ever born was a murderer and killed his own brother, slew him. He was a murderer. Cain killed Abel. Now, ever since that time, every child who's been born has been born with what we call a sin nature, something inside pulling him in the wrong direction. S-I-N is what we are. That's our nature. By one man's sin, S-I-N, entered into the world. S-I-N-S, sins, are the things we do because we are what we are. The sins do not make the sinner. The sinner makes the sins. A dog is not a dog because he barks. <laughs> he barks because he's a dog. The bark doesn't make the dog. The dog makes the bark. The sins do not make the sinner. The sinner makes the sins. Sins are the fruit. Sin is the root. Sometimes church membership is the suit that we try to use to cover up the fruit. But you don't need a suit to cover up the fruit. You need a new root inside, which I mean by that a new nature. And when you get a new nature or a new root, then you have new fruit. That sounds a little uh, uh, like a tongue twister, I suppose. I'll make it as plain as I can. If Jesus is not the virgin-born Son of God, then Jesus himself is going to hell, and everybody else is going to hell. I say that very reverently. But if you have no plan of salvation, if Jesus is a sinner, you see, since he was born of a virgin without an earthly father, he did not inherit the same sin nature that you inherited when you were born. Thus, he is not a sinner. Jesus himself said, The prince of this world is come and hath nothing in me. Literally meaning he has nothing in me he can get a hold of. I don't have a sin nature. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin which literally means apart from sin. Jesus was tempted apart from the sin nature. He had no sin nature because he was the virgin-born son of God, and he's called in the Bible the only begotten son of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus is a son of God in a very unique way. No one else is God's son in the same fashion that Jesus is. He is the begotten son. Actually, the seed that produced Jesus came from heaven. So that he's called six times in the Gospel of John, the only begotten of the Father. The only begotten son. His only begotten son, and so on. He's the son of God. Now, since he was born like he was born, he did not inherit the sin nature. So don't you see, friend, the virgin birth is not something you can take or leave. If you destroy it, you destroy Christianity B because you destroy your sinless substitute and you do not have a plan of salvation. There are other things, too, that are fundamental, that are essential, that you cannot destroy. Not only the virgin birth of Jesus, but the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross for sinners. Now, there's only one plan of salvation. Now, wait a minute. I, I don't mean to be narrow. I don't think that only Baptists are right. Don't misunderstand me. But I think the Bible's right. As a matter of fact, I know the Bible's right. The Bible said, let God be true and let every man be a liar. That's Romans 3, 4. And we must accept what God says in the Bible. And Acts 4, 12 says, 
neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Now here it is. We are sinners. Because we are sinners, we owe a sin debt. The Bible said in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18 and 4 says, The soul that sinneth it shall die. James 1, 15 says, When sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Now you do what you want to, but the Bible says, Sin demands a payment, and the payment for sin is death. And that death is described in the Bible as the second death, the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 14. Now, here's what happened 2,000 years ago, whether you believe it or not, whether you ever do anything about it or not, you don't change the fact. 2,000 years ago, God took every sin you ever have committed and every one you ever will commit if you live to be a million years old, and God laid those sins over on Jesus Christ, just like I laid my Bible on this desk before me. Your sins are laid over on Jesus. Now, that's not just preacher talk. That's exactly what the Bible says. Isaiah 53, 6 says, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. 1 Peter 2, 24 says that he his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, God hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, friend, this is the true story. This is what Calvary is all about. God took all your sins, put them over on Jesus. And while Jesus was bearing your sin in his body, God punished Jesus in your place because he loved you so much. And he punished him in your place so that you could go to heaven so that God would not sacrifice his justice on the altar of his love. He loves men. He doesn't want men to go to hell. But, uh, but God also is just. And God had said, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God had said, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Wait a minute. God can't back off of his word. He wouldn't be God if he lied. He'd dethrone himself. He cannot lie. Hebrews 6, 18 said it's impossible for him to lie. A just God demanded a penalty for sin. All men are sinners by virtue of their birth. Psalm 51 and 5, David said, In sin did my mother conceive me, and behold, I was shapen in iniquity. All men are sinners by birth and by choice. Thus all men owe the same sin penalty. A just God said it must be paid for. But a loving God sent his son, born of a virgin without sin, put our sin over on his son, and then punished his son in our place to pay the debt that we owe so that he could let us come to heaven if we would accept the payment that Jesus made, if we would believe on the Lord Jesus, which means trust him, rely on him, depend on him. I believe I am a sinner. I believe I do owe the debt. I believe the gospel story that Jesus died on the cross for me to pay my debt. I don't only believe it, but I accept it. And I trust Jesus and what he did on the cross to get me to heaven. Now, friend, that is one of the fundamentals of the faith. The substitutionary death of Jesus, which is God's only plan, and I must emphasize it, God's only plan of salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The world, meaning the people world, everybody in it. Me, you, everybody else. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son to die on the cross in our place to pay our sin debt. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
And friend, that's as simple as I can make it. Christ took your place, bore your sins, died on a cross, and paid your debt. If you'll believe it, accept him, trust him, depend on him, rely on him, when you die, you will go to heaven. Now, that is a fundamental. Because if Jesus did not die on the cross to pay the sinner's debt, then nobody's going to heaven. If he's not virgin born, he doesn't qualify to die on the cross to pay the debt because he too is a sinner. Don't you see that the virgin birth then and the substitutionary death of Jesus is a fundamental of the Christian faith? Now the literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus is a fundamental. Now I don't mean by this a spiritual resurrection. I mean Jesus came out of the grave literally, physically, bodily. Flesh and bones came out of that grave, and that tomb is empty. Now, I don't want to take time in this series of lessons to try to prove to you the resurrection of Jesus. I just want to show you the importance of it. You cannot be a Christian and deny the resurrection. Now, you may not believe it because you don't know, but if you have studied and know what the Bible says and then deny the resurrection, you can't be a Christian. Because Jesus said in Romans 10, verse 9, If thou shalt believe in thine heart the Lord Jesus, and confess with thy mouth that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9, and 10. You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that God's raised him from the dead. Wait a minute. Five times before his crucifixion, Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. He prophesied his resurrection at least five times before his death. If he was not raised from the dead, then we would not know that he's who he claimed to be. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead was a declaration of his deity. Romans 1, 4 said he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Two, when God raised Jesus from the dead, God was saying, I'm satisfied with the payment that Jesus made for your sins. Being the virgin-born Son of God and thus sinless, he could be our substitute. God took all of our sin, placed it on Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross to pay our sin debt and cried out from the cross, it is finished. He was buried. He stayed three days and nights in that tomb. And on the third day, God raised him from the dead as a declaration that he was satisfied with the payment that Jesus had made for our sins. The resurrection is something that God did to show us that he accepted the payment that Jesus made for our sins. Don't you see the resurrection is important? Let me say this. If Christ was not raised from the dead, then the Bible says nobody else will be raised. Paul said our preaching is in vain, and we're yet in our sins. He meant by that that Jesus wasn't a fellow to die for our sins and pay our debt. He wasn't raised from the dead. He said that death on the cross is vain and void. There's nothing to it. We're still in our sins. He said we've been made liars and false witnesses. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So you see then, friend, the resurrection of Jesus is a fundamental. Now if a guy comes along and says, I don't believe in the resurrection, I think his spirit came out of the grave. That is not a resurrection. It, you know, it's, uh, it's unusual and a little bit confusing and time and perplexing because the modernists and the liberal and the apostate, the book that uh, the Jude, uh, the people that the book of Jude's written about, the apostate, those men will use the same terms you use but won't mean the same thing. They're like a communist. When they say peace, they mean one thing. When we say peace, we need another thing. They don't mean that they mean when communism rules the world. To them, a perfect picture of peace is when every country in the world is a communistic country and they rule the whole world. To us, peace means to be left alone and not be fighting with us. Let us do like we want to do and have freedom. That's peace to us. Now, when the modernist says resurrection, he doesn't mean a literal, physical, bodily resurrection. 
he means that Jesus' spirit came out of the grave. But friends, his body came out of the grave, and that's a fundamental. You can't deny that and have Christianity. That is the keystone that holds the whole arch together. You destroy the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you destroy everything. Uh, two uh, agnostics got together and said if we could disprove two things, we could destroy Christianity. One of them said if we could disprove the conversion of the Apostle Paul, and if we could disprove the resurrection of Jesus, we could destroy Christianity. So one set out and dedicated his life to disprove the conversion of Paul. The other set out and dedicated his life to disprove the resurrection of Christ. A year or so later, they met back together. One said to the other, I've searched and searched for years and days and months to disprove the conversion of Paul. But he said to his friend, I've discovered that the conversion of Paul is a fact, that he was actually converted on the road to Damascus. And friend, I, I've been converted too. The other one said, I've searched and searched and tried to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. But instead of proving he wasn't raised from the dead, I've only proved to myself that he was raised from the dead. And the resurrection is, is, a, is a, fa a positive fact. And I too have accepted Christ as my Savior. Well, I don't know if it's a true story, but I heard the story. I do know this, the resurrection of Jesus is a fundamental. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now Jude said, I wanted to write about salvation, but the Holy Spirit constrained me to write unto you and exhort you to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Now they're to contend for something. What is it? They are to contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, I suppose the faith would mean all the word of God. Many of the great doctrines of the faith are mentioned in this one chapter book. For instance, in verse 1, you have the doctrine that God is the Father of all who believe. In verse 4, you have the glorious doctrine of the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 4, you have the doctrine of the grace of God. In verse 7, you have the doctrine of the total depravity of man. In verse 19, you have the doctrine of the personality of the Holy Spirit. In verse 9, you have the doctrine of the existence of a personal devil. In verse 6, 7, and 13, you have the doctrine of the fact of judgment and hell. In verse 11, you have the doctrine of justification by faith alone. In verse 14, you have the doctrine of the personal return of Christ. In verse 24, you have the doctrine of the eternal security of blood-bought believers. By the way, the same doctrine in verse 1. In verse 25, you have the doctrine of the sovereignty and the keeping power of God. In verses 5 through 19, you have the doctrine of the historical accuracy and the prophetic value of the Old Testament and New Testament scriptures. So you see, all these tremendous doctrines are found in this one chapter book. So when Jude says we're to contend for the faith, I suppose he would mean by that all the word of God, because the Bible is the word of God. But we talk about the fundamentals of the faith. There are some things a man could go to heaven without believing or without practicing. A man could go to heaven without being baptized in water. Baptism doesn't save. Now, wait a minute. If a man is saved, he ought to be baptized. If he doesn't, he's a disobedient Christian. But you're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, not by being baptized. You're saved by trusting Christ as Savior, not by living good. So, you see, you may have different beliefs about whether or not a man ought to be immersed or sprinkled or have the water poured on him or what have you. I'm a Baptist. The only scriptural baptism is a baptism by immersion. But a fellow hasn't been immersed, if he's trusted Christ as Savior, he would go to heaven. He may be a disobedient Christian, but he'd go to heaven. But there are some things that are what we call essentials, the fundamentals. You can't sacrifice these things and still have Christianity. And I've been sharing them with you very briefly, because I want you to see the importance of verse 3, where Jude said the Holy Spirit 
constrain me to write unto you and exhort you to earnestly contend for the faith. The fourth fundamental is the verbal inspiration of the Scriptures. That simply means we believe the Bible is the Word of God. We do not believe the Bible is a good book. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. There are many books that are good books, but the Bible is the Word of God. Now, the difference between a modernist and a fundamentalist is this. A modernist will say he believes the Bible contains the Word of God. But a fundamentalist will tell you he believes the Bible is the Word of God. From the very first verse in Genesis to the last verse in the book of Revelation. Now, I'm a fundamentalist. I believe the Bible's the Word of God in its original writings. I believe that uh, God inspired men to write the Bible, and they spoke as they were moved on by the Holy Spirit so that the Bible is called the Word of God. Jesus himself said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Over and over and over in the Bible you'll find the expression, Thus saith the Lord, Thus saith the Lord. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord. The Lord has spoken through the mouth of his prophet, saying, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, and so on. Now, I don't have time to try to prove to you the verbal inspiration of the Scriptures. That is not the purpose of these series of lessons. The thing I'm trying to point out here is that the verbal inspiration of the Scriptures is a fundamental of the Christian faith. The Bible is the Word of God. It's inerrant, and it is infallible. And it is inspired. It is the Word of God. The Holy Bible must have been inspired of God and not of men. I would not if I could believe that good men wrote it to deceive. And bad men would not if they could proceed to write a book so good. And no crazy man could <laughs> ever conceive its wondrous plan. So pray what other kind of men than do these three groups comprehend? So it must be that God inspired the words that souls of prophets fired. Now, friend, the Bible's the Word of God. That's a fundamental. When I think of contending for the faith, I think basically of the great fundamentals of the faith, the great cardinal doctrines, the virgin birth, the blood atonement, the physical resurrection of Jesus, the verbal inspiration of the Scriptures, and finally, the second coming of Christ. There are 20 times as many references in the Old Testament to the second coming of Christ as the are his first coming. And there's many, many prophetic passages in the Bible that will never be fulfilled if Jesus Christ doesn't come again. Christ will have to come again to sit on David's throne. He'll have to come again to rule the nations with a rod of iron. He'll have to come again to bring about a worldwide peace and to be the prince of peace. Isaiah 9, verse 6, 7, and 8 can never be fulfilled unless Jesus comes again. Because there it says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. There's a utopia ahead. When Jesus comes and he puts down all government and all authority, and he establishes his own earthly kingdom, there'll be peace in the earth, and there won't be peace until that time. So the second coming of Christ is a fundamental. If it's not, then at least two-thirds of the Bible is not true, because that much of the Bible prophecy will never be fulfilled. So don't you see, these great cardinal doctrines are important. May I tell you in passing that a fundamentalist is one who believes in these great fundamentals of the faith that I have very briefly shared with you in the last two or three days. If a man believes in these things, he's a fundamentalist. And you know, most people who are Christians are fundamentalists, but fundamentalists have been misrepresented so often that many Christians don't want to be identified with them. If you believe these great cardinal doctrines, you are a fundamentalist. Now, that's the thing Jude said we're to contend for. We're to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. We're not to compromise with a modernist, a liberal, uh, an infidel, 
who doesn't believe the Bible, who doesn't believe in the virgin birth, who doesn't believe in the blood atonement and the literal resurrection of Jesus nor the second coming. We're not to compromise with people who deny the fundamentals of the faith. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. If a fellow doesn't believe the Bible, all right, that's his right. He can choose to believe the Bible as the Word of God or not to believe it. But then I have a right too. I have the right to obey the Scripture and not yoke up with that man in some endeavor when he uh, deliberately rejects revealed truth, when he laughs at the virgin birth, when he knows the Bible said Christ was virgin born, when he laughs at the literal physical resurrection when the Bible teaches it, then I have a right to separate myself from that kind of a man. Now, wait a minute. I don't mean hate him. I'm to love him. I'm to pray for his salvation. The apostate is not saved. The apostate has received light, but not life. And the apostate rejects the truth that has been revealed to him. I mean by that he's read it in the Bible. He knows what the Bible teaches, but he deliberately rejects revealed truth. He says, I know the Bible says that, but I don't believe it. And he tries to explain it away. Now, that's an apostate. That's a liberal. That's a modernist. Those are the people that are dealt with in this little one-chapter book of Jude. William Coder calls it the Acts of the Apostates, and that's a good title for the book of Jude, as you'll see when we study the remainder of these verses in this one short chapter. Now, Jude said, we as Christians are to contend for the faith. Earnestly contend speaks of vigorous, intense, determined struggle to defeat the opposition. Our English word for earnestly contend is agony. We should defend the doctrines of Christianity. 1 Peter 3.15 says we're to be ready at all times to give an answer for the hope that is in us. In the Greek, this is a, t a technical term of the law courts, speaking of the attorney for the defense presenting a verbal defense for his client. We are to present a verbal defense for our client, which is the faith. We're to defend the faith. We're to contend for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints. Now, that word once doesn't mean once upon a time, but it means once for all. In other words, there will be no more faith. Everything that God wants to say to us, he has said in the Bible. There'll be no additional revelation. The faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Did you know every false cult in the country is based on what the Bible says plus somebody's additional revelation? Either somebody had a dream or a vision and wrote it in a book, or they claim to have found some book somewhere and they added it to the Bible. Or they claim to have seen one commandment stand up above all the other ten and to build a religion off of that. Or they have a, a, a book uh, key to the Scriptures. But they add something to the Scriptures. Every false cult and religion in the world adds to the Bible. Now, friend, I don't have a religious axe to grind. My daddy didn't choose that I be a Baptist preacher. He never encouraged it. He never asked me to go away to... Baptist college and be a Baptist preacher. I am what I am by my own choice, and I became a preacher after I was married and had two children. I was out on my own several years before God ever dealt with me about being a preacher. I'm a Baptist by choice. Now, I love the folk in other denominations who believe in the fundamentals of the faith, but I, I think the Baptists are nearer to what the Bible says than anybody else. Now, I know I get a lot of complaints about that, <laughs> But I think a rooster who won't crow in his own barns, you ought to wring his neck and make chicken and dumplings out of him. I'm Baptist born and Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. I'm Baptist. <laughs> Somebody asked my friend, Dr. Jack Howells, what would you be if you wasn't a Baptist? Dr. Howells said I'd be ashamed. <laughs> well, I don't know that I'd answer like that, but I am a Baptist by choice. Now there are people in other denominations who are saved. 
if they believe in the virgin birth and believe Christ died for sinners and they're trusting him. But now back to what I was saying. We're to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Now, how can you, as a Christian, a layman, contend for the faith? Well, let me make three or four suggestions to you. First, do you believe in the great doctrines of the faith? Do you believe in the virgin birth, the blood atonement, the physical resurrection of Jesus, the verbal inspiration of the Scriptures, and the second coming? If you believe in these great fundamentals of the faith, then I suggest, first of all, that you support those who preach the fundamentals of the faith and withhold your support from a man who is wishy-washy, who will not stand up for the great doctrines of the faith. If he's ashamed of it, then you should not give your dollars to a man to pay a salary when that man does not stand up for the great fundamentals of the faith. In the second place, Separate yourself from those who deny the fundamentals. Don't yoke up with a man who laughs at the virgin birth of Jesus. How can you claim to love Jesus with all your heart and then hold hands and hobnob with the fella that says Jesus is the illegitimate son of a German soldier? Well, that's enough to make my blood boil. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, according to the Bible. Now, when men come along and deny the virgin birth, if you believe in the fundamentals of the faith and you want to contend for the fundamentals of the faith, then you separate yourself from those who deny the fundamentals of the faith. You see that not one dime of your money goes to pay a man's salary who does not believe in the fundamentals of the faith. Wait a minute. If he denies one fundamental of the faith, you see that not one red cent of your money goes to him. Don't put your money into an organization where it is later channeled out to those who spit on the Bible and laugh at the virgin birth and tell the next generation of preachers that if they believe all the Bible is the word of God, that they're a candidate for the insane asylum. Now, wait a minute, Christian friend. You're going to answer to God someday for where your money went. You believe in the fundamentals of the faith, but if your money goes off to a university or seminary, to pay our professor's salary to teach the next generation of preacher boys that the Bible is not the Word of God, then your money is raising a generation of preachers that are going to damn this country. And you're going to answer to God for it when you stand at the judgment seat because they could not have educated those kids in that fashion had it not been for your financial support. The only language that the liberals understand is hold the money back. The liberals never built anything. The fundamentalist dollars built most things that are worth having. And the liberals moved in and took over, as we'll learn from verse 4 in just a few days on these broadcasts. Separate yourself from those who deny the fundamentals. And in the third place, if you believe in the fundamentals of the faith, then you live what you believe. You be an example Christian. And then, number four, be a faithful witness. And number five, speak out against those who preach another gospel. Don't uh, stand around with your mouth closed and a fellow up blatantly denying the Lord Jesus and denying the virgin birth and laughing at the inspiration of the Scriptures. Don't sit idly by. Stand up and be heard. Say, wait a minute, buddy. Wait a minute. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Give my dollar back out of that offering plate. I don't want a dollar to go to support your kind. Now, you have a command. Jude said, I wanted to write about salvation. But the Holy Spirit made me, constrained me to write about something else, and that is to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. That means vigorous, intense, determined struggle to defeat the opposition. And then you can contend for the faith by encouraging the pastor who stands for the great fundamentals and who believes the Bible and stands for it without apology. Don't stand behind a wishy-washy, potato string, backbone, rose water squirting, take it easy, Casper milk toast, modernistic preacher who starts nowhere and ends up at the same place. Stand behind the fellow who believes the Bible is the word of God and who preaches it without apology. 
Now, the faith was once delivered to the saints. That doesn't mean once upon a time, but it means once for all. The Bible is God's revelation to man. It is all of God's revelation to man. What God has to say to men, he has said in the Bible. If someone comes along and says to you, God has given me a special revelation, you get away from that guy. Because God gives nobody special revelations. God has revealed in his word what his desire for you is. He has revealed in his word what he expects you to do as a Christian. And he will not give you a special revelation through some preacher or through some prophet or through some seer. By the way, if a man claims to have a special revelation from God, then the revelation he received from God is an addition to the Bible. And the Bible plainly says we're not to add to his words nor take away from his words. Read the last chapter of the book of Revelation. The Bible said if you add to these words or take away, God shall add the plagues of these book to you and take your part out of the book of life. Now, God is jealous over his word. Psalm 138, verse 2 says, Thou hast magnified thy word even above thy name. God puts his word above his name. We're to stand for the Bible. It's the word of God. Don't accept anybody's additional revelation. If they claim to have had some vision or some dream, you just forget that. You accept what the Bible says, not what somebody says they receive from God. Because this faith was once for all delivered to the saints. There won't be any more. This is it. Now, why are we to contend for the faith? Verse 4 tells us why. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord that bought them, the, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jude said we're to contend for the faith because certain men have crept in unaware. These men are described in the Bible as the ministers of Satan. They're like angels of light. They, they are apostate teachers. And remember that I said an apostate is someone who deliberately rejects revealed truth. He sees what the Bible says, but he don't believe it. Did you know all the great schools in America, Harvard, Yale, Oberlin, and you name them, all the great schools in America were founded by fundamental Christians, and they used to have prayer meetings on the campuses, they used to hold revival meetings on the campuses. You get some history books about Yale and Harvard and Oberlin and some of the other great colleges and universities. You'll find where they used to have revival meetings and close classes and have prayer meetings. The young men would get together and pray. They were originally started to train preachers. But what happened? Through the years, in the name of scholarship, in the name of education, Modernism has crept in. Here and there, they've hired a teacher who doesn't believe the Bible's the Word of God, who doesn't believe in the virgin birth. Then they hire another one and another one until eventually modernism is taken completely over. And on most of the great universities, communists can go on campus and lecture, but you can't go on lecture and preach a, uh, on campus and preach a sermon. What happened? These great schools did not turn liberal and modern overnight. What happened is that certain men crept in unaware. 